According to the organization, one out of 100 witnesses are disfellowshipped each year. Out of this, two-thirds will not be reinstated. There are over one million disfellowshipped ones alive today that are being shunned. Their families and friends have nothing to do with them because they are disfellowshipped. As we found out in the previous video, Nathan Knorr became the president and therefore the faithful slave of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in January of 1942. We went over how he instituted no blood transfusions in 1944. In this video, we're going to go over how Nathan Knorr then instituted the disfellowshipping arrangement as we know it today in 1952. Let me ask you a question. Is it loving or even natural for a mother to turn her back on her child? For a father to not help his child even when they are in desperate need? To throw someone out of their living arrangements? To make it so that a parent cannot talk to or see their child? To make a person lose their means of living all because they either made a mistake or they don't believe like you do any longer. See, Charles Russell and Joseph Rutherford, the first two presidents and faithful servants, did not believe in excommunication, what today is known as disfellowshipping. As you see here, the January 8, 1947 Awake asked the question, are you also excommunicated? The article stated that if you were one of the 138 million born in and raised Protestants, you were already excommunicated. That means that you were looked upon with the blackest contempt by the Vatican, being cursed and damned with the devil and his angels. The article goes on to state that this is canon law which the Roman Catholic hierarchy seeks to enforce on the pretext that it is God's law. The authority for excommunication, they claim, is based on the teachings of Christ and the Apostles as found in Matthew, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, 1 Timothy, and Titus. But it goes on that the hierarchy's excommunication as punishment finds no support in the scriptures. In fact, it is altogether foreign to Bible teachings. The article states as the pretensions of the hierarchy increased, the weapons of excommunication became the instrument by which the clergy attained a combination of ecclesiastical power and secular tyranny that found no parallel in history. However, if we just fast forward five years to the March 1st, 1952 Watchtower, excommunication or disfellowshipping, which just five years earlier was stated as being unbiblical and used as a means of control and tyranny became introduced to Jehovah's Witnesses as a means of keeping the congregation clean. In 1979, my husband was not baptized. He had some friends who were. They were normal youths who got in a little trouble, nothing major but they ended up in the back room for stupid things young ones do. Those who were baptized were threatened with disfellowshipping. My husband was threatened with disassociation, which is the same as being disfellowshipped. Those are not empty threats, are they? In January of 1982, if you chose to no longer believe as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you were now to be considered disfellowshipped. I personally remember the announcements that were made. At one time, it was announced that you were disfellowshipped or disassociated as an announcement to the congregation, basically telling the congregation to have nothing to do with that person. I even remember when it was announced what you were disfellowshipped for. However, the organization came into legal problems with privacy. Now, it is announced that a person is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Basically, they are now part of the world.
nearly 80,000 witnesses are disfellowshipped a year. This does not include those that no longer believe as a witness any longer, so have disassociated themselves as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, yet they've committed no biblical sin. They just no longer want to be known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Where exactly in the Bible are we told to do that? Once a person is disfellowshipped or disassociated, anyone in their social circles, including their parents, are not to have anything to do with them. If a child is still living under the roof of their parents, that child is required to go to all the meetings with their parents. They're not allowed any association outside of the house and many times are told that if they do not follow all of the house rules, they will be kicked out onto the streets. Sadly, many children have found themselves in just that situation. You don't think that's right? Well, if you remember just a few years ago at the regional convention, the video of the disfellowship daughter trying to call her mother, the daughter who looked in need of either physical help, financial help, maybe even mental help, calling her mother. What did the mother do? Push the phone away, turned her back on her daughter who really needed her at that moment. The father looked on in an approving manner when she did this. How can we expect a loving God, whom we are made in the image of, in any way think that that is okay? Now, I understand the scriptures regarding those who commit fornication, adultery, what have you, and I do agree that one who continually goes against God's morals should be considered bad association. But where in the Bible does it say if a person made a mistake and comes to the older men that they need to be completely cut off from everyone they know? How can another imperfect man read another person's heart, whether they are repentant or not? Where in the Bible are those men given that authority? Where in the Bible are they given the authority to tell parents not to talk to their children? Where in the Bible are they told to announce the name in front of everybody so that everybody has nothing to do with the person? C.T. Russell did not have disfellowshipping while he was the faithful slave. Joseph Rutherford did not have disfellowshipping while he was the faithful slave. When Nathan Knorr became the faithful servant, he did not institute disfellowshipping at first. In fact, it was Nathan Knorr who wrote that article on excommunication that we went over earlier. Disfellowshipping came into effect in 1952, instituted by Nathan Knorr after calling it unbiblical. What did Jesus say? He told the Jews, All therefore whatsoever they tell you, observe and do. By commanding them to observe and do what the Pharisees instructed them, Jesus certainly did not mean that they should follow the false teachings of the Pharisees, but rather those teachings that naturally and correctly arose from the law of Moses. In general, the Pharisees were upholders of the law, and should be recognized for this. But Jesus went on immediately to command the people, do not do according to their works, for they say, but they do not practice what they say. He then went on to cite the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. In verse five, they lay heavy religious rules upon the people, but would not do anything to make the load lighter. Their own works were done to be observed by men rather than God. When Jesus said that families would be divided because of him at Matthew 10, 35, he was saying that family members who didn't believe in him would turn on those that did believe in him, not because they broke any rule. Those types of commandments and rules went away when Jesus died at the stake, remember? Then Jesus went on to give us two commands to cover all Mosaic law and the commandments that Israelites were under. He said to love Jehovah with your whole heart and to love one another. 
Don't you think those two commandments cover everything else? So why do we now have all of these rules or laws put upon us? Isn't that what the Pharisees did to God's people during Jesus' time? Who did Jesus ever shun? The prostitute? The tax collector? The woman who completely disobeyed the law by touching his garment while unclean? No. Instead, he taught to win them over by showing them true love, as he showed by his example. The governing body used this scripture in 1 Corinthians that says we're not to eat with a person. They've taken this scripture and twisted it to the point where they now stand in front of the audience and say, none of you are allowed to speak to that person. If they made a mistake and the elders do not feel the person is repentant enough. How can shunning your loved one or friend be considered loving? Basically, I'm going to show you love by absolutely ignoring you and not showing you any love at all. Because that's what disfellowshipping is, plain and simple. To completely cut one's entire social and family circle away. It has actually driven some to commit suicide. If you ever watch an interview with someone who's been in prison, they'll tell you that the worst thing that can possibly happen to them is solitary confinement. Solitary confinement can actually drive you insane. As a witness being disfellowshipped, it's actually like being in solitary confinement because when you're disfellowshipped, you don't know anyone else. Are we supposed to associate with anyone in the world? When you're disfellowshipped, you will not be reinstated if you're having constant worldly association. This practice has actually come to the attention of governments in certain countries. Norway's charitable status has been taken away from Jehovah's Witnesses due to their disfellowshipping practices. Belgium, Sweden, and other countries are starting to try and follow suit. They find that the complete shunning of a person violates their human rights and is a defamation of character. We're told that the disfellowshipping arrangement is a loving provision. How is it considered loving or imitating Jesus when if somebody makes a mistake, we turn our back on them completely? Or if they decide that they do not believe as we do any longer, we have nothing to do with them. Jesus is our greatest example to follow. Then why don't we follow his example of love? Why are we more like the scribes and Pharisees that he condemned because of all of the rules that they put upon the yokes of their followers? I know that if any of my family or friends, basically everyone I know, knew how I felt about the organization, I would lose all of them. Not because I don't believe in the Bible or Jesus, but because I don't believe how they believe any longer. I haven't committed any sin or done anything wrong. Is that what the Bible actually teaches? Since I was born into the organization and have never associated with anyone outside of the organization, I don't know anyone outside of the organization that I am close to or are friends with. The organization was my life. So, for now, I remain silent so I don't lose all of my loved ones. This is just something else to think about. As we go into the 1960s on, I'll be able to relate things personally because I've lived for over five decades as a witness and I've seen many things. And my parents have told me things as well. See, my mom and dad met while they were both working in Bethel during the late 1950s. They remained there for over six years dating with chaperones, so they would be able to marry and remain at Bethel. But after six years, they decided to leave to get married. See, they hadn't met the time requirements to remain at Bethel and marry. Yes, there were time requirements to stay and marry while at Bethel then, I honestly don't know if that still applies. 
It did when my brother served in the 80s and 90s. My mom and dad had to have lived and worked at Bethel for a minimum of seven years each or a combination of years that added up to a total of 14 years at Bethel. After they spoke to Nathan Knorr, he gave them his blessing to leave and marry, but they couldn't return since they left to get married before the required amount of years. More rules that were made up, but that's a whole other story in itself. So far, we've gone over how Nathan Norris started to institute the No Blood Transfusion Doctrine in 1944, how he then instituted disfellowshipping as we know it today. Nathan Knorr also changed the date from Jerusalem being destroyed in 606 to 607 BCE. Yet, that did not affect the year 1914 at all. Changing it to either 1913 or 1915, as one would think changing a year would do. That's what we're going to discuss in an upcoming video. If you're enjoying this content, please like algorithms. And if you've really enjoyed this video, please subscribe so that you can get notified. And as always, thank you for watching.